Amen. All right, for the rest of us, let's go to the Word of God in Exodus. Did you get something? In the book of Exodus, chapter 4. I'm asking if you would rest on your feet with me for the reverence, to show reverence to God's Word. Next time I ask you to stand, it'll be to go home. Exodus chapter 4. We'll begin at verse number 1 through verse number 5. Amen. Giving our honor and reverence to God, who's the reason we live, breathe, and have our being. Without him, we can do nothing. But with him, all things are possible. Thank God for everyone it takes to make up this congregation, and most especially my sweet loving sugar. The cream in my coffee. Sugar in my Kool-Aid. Peanut butter on my jelly. All right, moving on. Exodus 4, beginning in verse 1. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and he caught it. And it became a rod in his hand that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob had appeared unto thee. I want to focus on the passage where God told him, cast it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it, and the Lord said, Put forth thine hand and take it up by the tail. The rod became a snake, and God challenged him to pick it up. Look at your neighbor. Tell him, neighbor, God's telling you to pick it up. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Pick it up. Pick it up. Pick it up. Pack it in. Let me begin. For my old school hip hop heads. Um, we've been talking about being influencers. God has created us to be influencers, which is another word for leaders. The word leadership simply means influence. Leadership is the capacity to influence others or influence a particular outcome. We're all called to be influencers. Everybody in this sanctuary is an influencer, whether you realize it or not. You are called to be a leader. You are called to be one that makes a difference, that has an impact on the world that you live in. To prove your call to be influencers, when you read Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it's the mission statement, God's mission statement for man. For God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. Let them have influence. Let them have leadership. Let them have management. Let them have control. Let them influence my will on the earth. God created man to carry out his assignment on earth as God ruled and reigned from heaven. Every person on the planet was called to be used by God to make an impact. Leaders, influencers. Influencers, contrary to popular beliefs, are not just those that got a million followers on Twitter or on Instagram, or whatever. Influencers are those that leave situations better than they found them. Those that leave people feeling better than they, let, than they met them. It, it's those that have an impact, watch this, even on the worst of situations. Your true influence can be revealed when times are at that worst. And I want to show you how that is today as we look at the text. We look at this particular scripture because oftentimes I've come to find we miss it because we fail to see the impact that we are to have and that we do have 
for God showed me some so many years ago. We believe in God, but oftentimes we don't believe in the God in us. We believe God is able to do anything until he requires our involvement. God can do it. I know he'll work it out. And we pray, Lord, fix it. And then God put on your heart to do something. Oh, wait a minute. No, I ain't good at that. I don't, I don't, no, I don't do that. I'm, 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 I'm going to pray about it. As if God's power got limited when it came to involve you. And this is where the problem lies. See, I know. Listen, I grew up in church. I've been in church a lot longer than church been in me. Truth be told. And I grew up believing God could do anything, and he can. I grew up believing prayer works, and it does. I grew up believing you pray about it and just have faith. And I stopped there without accurate interpretation of what that meant. And if I tell the truth, I grew up very frustrated. Secretly frustrated because it wasn't religiously correct. It wasn't religiously correct to say you mad at God. To say God disappointed you. That God's letting you down. That God hasn't been hearing your prayers. But secretly, that's how I felt. Because I would pray and I would wait. And I would pray and I would wait. And I would pray and I would hope. And I would pray and I would wait. And not see the results. And it'd be frustrated. I would see people less spiritual with more results. Maybe it's just me. I would see it. I would say, now, Lord, I know you didn't do that for them. I've been over here begging you. And for real, they the ones get blessed. And I, I don't understand. And that was the exact problem. I didn't understand. My understanding was flawed. Because I thought you pray, and if you be pretty good, pretty good, P U R T Y, if you be pretty good, God would reward you with the blessing you prayed for. I told you I've been in church a lot longer than church been in me. So some of you may be about to get a news flash. That ain't quite how it really works. For one, I thought if I'm pretty good, God... Ain't nothing I got because of how good I feel. Not true. Now, it could be, some things could be due to how obedient I was to what he told me to do, that the action automatically released a certain result. But if anything is based on my goodness, then you sure enough need to snatch this mic right now. Rat is country for quicker than right now. If somebody tell you rat now, that means you already late. <laughs> so, so what I discovered, everything I got from God is by grace. Everything is by grace. What is grace? It's unmerited favor, unearned favor, undeserved favor. Everything I got, I'm graced to preach this gospel. Because I ain't never earned it. It's by grace. And faith is your positive response to grace. It's you believing in what God has done to the point to where your actions correspond in, agree, in alignment with that belief. Let, let's, 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 let's go deeper. Let's go deeper. Why don't we move forward? The greatest enemy you will ever face is enemy. Someone said if there's no enemy within, the enemy outside would do you no harm. The 
Your biggest enemy ain't the ones that's talking about you. Because the one, what they said about you ain't what stops you. What you say about you does. The only time what they say about me hinders me is when I open my mouth and agree. <sighs> Moses was afraid to move forward because of his past. So the question is, are the failures of your past hindering your future success? Do you look at what you're capable of doing based on what your past has taught you? Some of you, if I ask you to do something right now, you'd be like, uh-uh, I can't do that. I ain't good at that. Who told you you weren't good at that? Why do you believe that? Because somewhere in your past, you had a failure. And now you're looking at your future through the lenses of that failure, and you've already assigned, I can't do that. Which the only thing that's stopping you from doing that is your belief that you can't do that. So all the devil had to do was get you to fail one time and knowing you'll never try again. Knowing you would accept that as your way of life. This is what it is. What it is don't have to be, be based upon what it was. Because if the truth be told, I don't have a success without failures. See, we start failure as an indication I'm not good at something. Failure is an indication that you need more work at something. It doesn't mean you're not good at it. That, that's, what, that's what failure does. Because watch this. Everything you do, you failed into it. You didn't hear me. You learn, everything you learn, you learn from failure. Let me start real young. How did you learn how to walk? Falling. And then your head was too big for your body. And once that head got tilted, that was it. <laughs> you, your whole body on the ground. And some of us took a long time to walk. And some of us had big heads as a baby. Like a bobblehead. Oh, you can laugh. I ain't say your baby had a bobblehead. Amen or oh me, whichever fit. Here's the point. Here's the point. Here's the point. Here's the point. How did you learn how to ride a bicycle? Falling. We had knee pads when I was growing up. <laughs> we have helmets. And now I don't know if you're going to ride a bicycle or play football. I don't know. <laughs> you can tell when I was growing up. How did you learn how to roller skate? Falling. How you learn how to swim? Almost drowning. <laughs> the point I'm making, all of the basic things you learn to do, you were falling and making adjustments due to the last fall. And only the only ones that never learn how to do it are the ones that stop trying because of the failure. People that don't know how to ride a bike, it means you didn't get skin up again after you failed. That blood was enough for you. You're like, you know what? I'll wait till I can drive. <laughs> I'm like, but you're seven. You got 10 years. <laughs> but you get the point. Those that continue to take the risk of falling learn how to ride a bike. Those that continue to take the risk of falling on the skating rink learn how to roller skate. Don't, so if failure of your past is what you base your ability on, then you ain't going to have no future. That's the, that's, that's the indication. We, everybody failed. Michael Jordan is on record saying this. He said, I have failed time and and time again in my life. That's why I win. See, that's why I win. He credits his winning to his failures. Failure isn't final. Quitting is. And here Moses was afraid because he said, I tried to save the Hebrew people years ago and I failed. And now I'm wanted for murder. And here God is challenging him. 
So Moses was hiding out for 40 years because of fear. Fear paralyzes us from walking in our true influence, in our true leadership, in our true greatness. Fear. Fear. Here's, here's a very great quote by Nelson Mandela regarding fear. I want you to hear this. Nelson Mandela said, Courage is not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers their fear. Courageous, brave people, let me give you a news flash. They just as scared as you. They just didn't let it stop them. They did it anyway. Fear is a necessary component for faith to be necessary. I'm going to say that again. Faith has no job without fear. Because if you didn't have a fear, you wouldn't need a faith. I need faith when I'm scared. Because my faith is what's it. Oh, no, no, I got this. Okay, God, I trust you. <sighs> okay, let's do it. It don't mean my heart ain't still beating. My heart can still be pumping out of my chest. I'll never forget, I'll never forget this. When God gave me this revelation, he, and I, read, I was studying Elijah and, and the life of Elijah, and God showed me visually in my imagination the way I never saw it before in my life. Because we know Elijah is considered one of the biggest, baddest, boldest prophets of the Bible. Elijah walked up to King Ahab, told me, hey, King Ahab, because you've been so disobedient, it ain't going to rain no more. God going to punish you. And it ain't going to rain again till I say so. Now, King Ahab had the power to have him killed. King Ahab, King Ahab probably like, you know, y'all hear this fool right here? This fool talking about it ain't going to rain until he say so. Man, if you don't get your homies behind out of my face. And, and, and Elijah, I told you. I have spoken. And God showed me Elijah walked away. And when he got around the corner from King Ahab, he said, oh, 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 my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. I can't believe I just did it. I can't believe oh, God, what do I do now? Run to the brook. Okay. That he was this. Afraid as anyone. Good googly woo. Watch this. Look what the Holy Ghost just said. He was afraid as anyone. He just feared God more than everyone. <laughs> when you fear God more than everybody else, the other fear that you have of people is less. It's, it's still, it's there. But it doesn't control you when your fear of God is what's motivating you. I fear not pleasing him. I fear not being who he wants me to be. I fear not accomplishing his assignment. That's where the motivation comes in. Moses wasn't as afraid as anybody else, but he did it anyway. He was afraid to go before Pharaoh. You got to understand, man, this dude still had warrants. Ain't nobody trying to go in the police station with warrants. I don't even want to go there on a school trip. <laughs> yeah, you might not come back out. He goes to Pharaoh, and he ain't just got warrants. He on Egypt's most wanted list. Are you understanding that? They've been, they've been searching for him for 40 years. They, you're not hearing me. They still running reruns on A&E TV of most wanted never found. His picture's still in the Egypt post office. You don't understand. <laughs> in spite of all of that, Moses accepts the challenge. Now, finally, when Moses builds himself up enough, okay, God, I'm going to go. But God, what if they don't believe me? What, 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 if, what if they think I'm crazy? What if they don't listen to me? Like, what gives me credibility to do what I'm about to do? Why should they believe me? 
Because what's the other reason we don't step up to the plate and be the influencers and the leaders and the world changers God called us to be? Why won't we attack the problem? We talked last week about anger, about what bothers you, leading you to what you're supposed to fix. Why don't we step up to fix it? Here's the reason we don't do nothing about the problems that God given us a burden for that bothers. We don't think we have the tools. We don't think we have the necessary tools to make it better. I, we don't, Lord, I ain't got the money. To, if I, if, Lord, if I was rich, I'd do something about that. Or we feel we don't have the influence. We don't have the popularity. We don't have the charisma, the style, the talent. We don't have the education, the degrees. We don't have the credentials. There's always something that we don't have that we utilize in our minds that stops us from moving forward. If I just had this, the late great, my personal mentor, Brother Robert McHenry, often said, it's not what you don't have that's stopping you. It's what you think you need. That's what's stopping you from moving forward. And so here Moses is wondering, I ain't got nothing. Why would they listen to me? I ain't rich. I, 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 I'm a criminal. I'm a fugitive. I'm not articulate. I don't even know if I'm a great leader. Why would they listen to me? Watch God's answer. God's answer is a question. And it's the same question God asking you of those of you that are not stepping up to the challenge and the anointing God has called you to, to take a chance with what he put in your heart, what's on your mind. He says this, he says, Moses, what's in your hand? <laughs> That's good right there. What's in your hand? Moses looks. A darn stick? He says, a rod, a staff, a big old stick is in my hand. What's your point? That's your answer to what if they don't believe me? Lord, you know how many sticks in Egypt? <laughs> Bigger than mine. And you want me to go forth? With a stick I've been walking around with for 40 years? Here's the problem. When God shows you what's in your hand, the issue is you don't see it significantly. Uh, you're not valuing what he's given you because you've been taking it for granted for 40 years. Uh, never underestimate what God has already given you or the experience you've gained through what you've gone through. That's what you have in your hand. God will always use something he, you already have to bless you or something that's within your reach. He won't use something beyond your reach, something that you don't have access to. He will always, all through the Bible, all through the Bible, he will use what's in your hand. David would face with Goliath. And all he had was five smooth rocks. And he used what was in his hand to defeat the greatest warrior they'd ever seen. Samson got attacked by an army, Philistine army. And right beside him, within his reach, the Bible says, was the jawbone of an ass. He had the jawbone of a dead donkey. That's all he had. And with that, he killed the entire army. <laughs> God will never use what's outside of your reach. The problem is not what you have, it's how you see it. That's how you see it. God uses things that appears to be insignificant because that's how he gets the glory. If the staff in Moses' hand was Camelot's sword, <laughs> then they would have wrote stories about the sword. 
then this chapter will be about the sword. But when he do it with a stick, you can't give the credit to the stick. It's to God. He, what's in your hand? Every superhero has a superpower. We hadn't discovered our superpower. What are you trying to say? What's in your hand? Let me ask it to you another way. What's your gift? What are you good at? What's your talent? What's your idea? What's your dream? What's your vision? What's, what comes easy to you that's hard for others? What have you been sitting on? See, I don't care how. It, the problem is not, I ain't got nothing. No, you don't value nothing. Or you don't value nothing you have. You value what you see others with on Instagram. Because you keep saying, if I just had that, if you needed that, you would have had that. Google it, look what he just told me. When you don't value what you have, no one else will either. What's What's in your hand? What's in your hand? Stick. I'll never forget. True story. I was, I was having a hard financial difficulty, man. And years ago, I was praying. I was crying. God, like he wasn't listening. Like, I mean, I was like, God, what's up? Like, when, when we stopped speaking, I didn't know we fell out. <laughs> like, you just stopped answering my calls. I didn't I know what was up. I didn't know what I did. And finally, when I heard him, what he told me, was pretty, it was on the same line. He said, the problem is not that I ain't blessing you. The problem is you're not acknowledging what I've given you. And I'm praying for a financial blessing. Lord, I need some money. I, I don't need a lecture right now. I need some money. I don't need a riddle that I got to figure out. I need some money. <laughs> and God kept telling me. And then finally I listened and he had me to write down everything I can do. And I didn't even know I could do that much. Man, my list was so doggone long. And I looked at it. Then he started showing me on the list certain things that I can leverage for finances. He was showing me what was already in my hand. And then he started, because now I'm open. I ain't crying and com blaming him no more. I'm open. So now he's speaking to me. And he starts showing me how to leverage it. And I just start doing what he put in my heart to do. And I start making more money than I ever made in my entire life. And he didn't give me nothing new. He didn't give me nothing new. He showed me what was in. Somebody need to pray this prayer. Repeat after me. Lord. Show me what's in my hand. <laughs> and it may not look like much. I don't care if you ain't got nothing but a pretty smile. You all be walking around like the insight man. You ain't never seen that commercial? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's too much. Too much Sunday morning. If you ain't got nothing, you ought to be letting them all 52. Please. Why? Because if that's what he's giving you, that smile's going to melt somebody else's heart. It's going to lift somebody else's day. It's going to bless somebody else's life. If you, if you ain't got nothing but a mean sweet potato pie, you bake them pies and you bless folk with them. You're you going to blow up bigger than patty pies. Because when you discover what's in your hand, and oftentimes it ain't just one. Because I don't care how insignificant you think what's in your hand is. I guarantee it's more than a darn stick. So you working with more than Moses. <laughs> if Moses did all that, that's all he did with the stick. The stick threw it down, turned to a snake. Pharaoh got his magicians, threw their sticks down. Theirs turned to two snakes. So what made Moses special? Moses one ate up theirs. 
God did plagues through this stuff. Stick it in the river, the whole river turned into blood. This same stick, God said, Lord, Moses said, Lord, the Pharaoh's army behind us, the Red Sea in front of us, what you want me to do? You know what God asked Moses? What's in your hand? He said, it's stick, but a snake can't swallow this much water. He said, no, fool, stretch it out. Well, maybe he didn't say it like that, but it means say that. He said, stretch it out. He stretched that stick out in the Red Sea. They went across on dry land. Pharaoh's army got behind. Lord, they're coming to get us. What you want me to do? Guess what God asked him? What's in your hand? He said, stretch it out again. He stretched it out again. The Red Sea closed together and drowned on Pharaoh's army. God did all of this with a stick that was already in his hand for 40 years. 40 years. When God showed him what's in his hand, God said, cast it on the ground. He cast it on the ground and turned to a snake. And here's what God told him. God said, pick it up. He said, okay, let me pick it up. I watched the snake people on Discovery Channel. They grab it right around the throat. And God said, no, by the tail. By the tail. Even the snake people don't pick up a snake by the tail. Moses said, Lord, you're trying to get me killed. Killed is worse than being killed. It's a whole nother level of dead right there. When you fool around and get killed, ooh, you don't want to be killed. Trust me. It's worse than being killed any day of the week. And Moses is afraid because he knows if you pick it up by the tail, you done lost leverage because his entire body is able to attack you. And you're at a disadvantage because to pick it up by the tail, you already stooped down with your head right in the perfect place to be targeted by his mouth. Why does God always want to make it hard? If handling snakes ain't bad enough, you ain't going to even let me pick up the snake by his head? Why does God make it so hard? I'm glad you asked. Two things he wanted Moses to see. When you pick it up by the tail, it shows you have dominion that no one else even recognizes. Because you're able to do what no one else does. And it shows that what I put in your hand you control it so greatly that it can never be a threat to you. Because it knows you are its master. It's not yours. See, you're supposed to have your gift. Don't let your gift have you. When it have you is when you get beside yourself. You let it lead. He, he wanted to show him. And Moses grabbed it by the tail. And it turned back into a a rod. And Moses went forth to Pharaoh. Now, when he said cast it on the ground, God's asking you, when was the last time you used what was in your hand? There is nothing wrong with a nine to five job. Nothing wrong with it. But don't use it as an excuse to do nothing with what's in your hand. That's, that, that's, that's, when was the last time you used what he gave you? When was the last time you did what brings you fulfillment? Now, fulfillment doesn't come from what you get. Fulfillment comes from what you give. This is why the Bible says it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Because fulfillment comes when what you do makes such a difference, a positive difference, that it makes you feel good about yourself. That it gives your life meaning, value. 
you make a difference. You wasn't put here to make a living. You was put here to make a difference. Because if you make a good enough difference, making a living comes easy. You ain't got to worry about what you go eat when you make a big enough difference in other people's lives. This, this is, when was the last time you cast what's in your hand to work? When was the last time you used your gift to give? This is, when was the last, this is what you got to ask yourself. What have I been doing to improve the community and the environment around me? Have I been talking about everybody else's problems or have I been utilizing what God gave me to bless their problems? What have I been doing? I was talking with someone last week, and they was talking about, you know, I just hate talking to some of my family members because they start getting so negative, and they talk about the other ones when I'm around them, and all they do is I just try not to say nothing. I just try not to, and it really bothers me. I say, if it bothers you that much, that means you created to do something about it. But I don't want to get into it with them too, but I say, but no, but I know you. You have a very charming personality. You, you have great social skills. There's a way that you could check them on it in a way that doesn't create a fight because I know your personality. Say, what do you mean? When she come talking to you, girl, girl we ain't doing that because you know so-and-so go coach you, come trying to take up all the food, go want to take all these stuff home with them and all this, that, and the other, da 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 say, and say, and I just sit there. I didn't say nothing, but it really made me feel bad because I want them to eat the food. That's why I'm buying it. I say, well, you should have you told them. You know what? We both we both know that. That's why I'm buying extra just for them. So we're going to come. We're going to let them eat. We're going to have a good time. That's how you check the foolishness without creating a fight. It catches your attention because it needs your attention, but not your negative attention. You're called to be an influencer to be a solution. And if all we do is run from problems, we really miss opportunities. Because all these problems are opportunities to use what's in your hand. <laughs> Think about it. Now, let me give you the difference between wisdom and knowledge really quick. Knowledge tells you what to do. Knowledge is information. Wisdom tells you how to do it. Wisdom is application. Don't just seek God for knowledge. Make sure you get wisdom while you're there. Because a lot of times this is how we have good intentions and horrible results. Somebody need to say something. I'm finna I'm, I'm fin tell them. And you just made it worse. So how did you help? Now you were right in what you felt. I'm not mad at you. Somebody did need to say something. Something did need to be done. That's right. That's half the prayer. Stay on your knees. You done got knowledge, but don't get up without no wisdom. Because if God want me to do something, if I listen long enough, he'll show me how. Because I've learned when I do it his way, there are always positive results. So a lot of times people, Pastor, why you did nothing yet? I'm waiting on wisdom. I see, I see what needs to be done. Now I need to know how to do it. Because I can do the right thing the wrong way and create an explosion. Where, it, where I needed some water to put on the fire. Here, here, here's, 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 and let me get, let me get the next one. So God tells him, pick it up by the tail. Why does he tell him to pick it up by the tail? Because he's calling you to do something that reveals his authority and his power. And what God is calling you to do today, that thing that you've been had all this time that you ain't picked up in so long, God brought me here with you today to tell you it's time to pick it up again. It's time to pick that dream up again. It's been laying stagnant for too long. It's time to pick that assignment up again. It's time to pick your gift up again you ain't used in years. It's time you, you love to sing. You ain't sang in so long. Why? Because it's been laying there stagnant. God said, I need you to pick it up again. I need you to pick it up again. 
I need you to pick them children up again. I need, I need you to pick up that assignment again. I need you to pick it up again. Don't let it lie there. God said, I didn't give it to you to do nothing with it. I ain't never gave you nothing for nothing. Everything I gave you should serve a purpose. And if it's not serving a purpose, it's gonna, you, your life will prove or will reflect the lack of it being used. It's time to pick it up again. What is that thing? Pick it up again. And you may not be picking it up by the head. You may be picking it up by the tail. What do I mean by that? God told Peter one time when Peter was through fishing, he had fished all night, and now he was, he was tired. He was, he was, him and his whole crew, they were restless because they hadn't caught nothing, not even a minnow. They hadn't caught a sardine. They hadn't caught nothing. And they here washing all these nets. Jesus said, can I use your boat for a pulpit? Because it's, it's, the crowd is too big. I need to be able to preach to all of them. He said, sure. And he washing all his nets. Finally, he finished washing all his nets. Jesus said, hey, now I need you to go back out and let down all of them nets into the deep water this time. He said, what you mean, launch into the deep water? Ain't no fish biting now. We done fished all night. I know how to fish. You's a preacher. I'm a fisherman. You stick to that, I can stick to this. You can preach good, but I can fish about as good as you can preach. So I got, Jesus, launch out into the deep. So why am I launch out to the deep? That ain't going to work. What Jesus was telling them was, pick it up by the tail. Why else did God tell you to pick it up by the tail? It requires faith to do that. It don't require faith to do what makes sense. It requires faith when God tells you to call that person that did you dirty and, 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 and check on them and make right with them. I wish I would. I know. I get it. I'm not telling you to do it, but if God said it, how do I know if God said it? Has it been on your mind? Ooh. Let me tell you how you can know when God talking. You ready? It'll never agree with your flesh. <laughs> if it agree with your flesh, that ain't God. <laughs> that ain't God. And here it is. Here it is. He tell them, pick it up out there. Lunch into the deep. Find the pieces. All right, throw out one of them old raggedy nets. I'm going to throw out all these nets. I took all night, washed them up, cleaned them out. He threw it down in the deep water. So many fish came, it broke the net. God say, when you pick it up again this time, I need you to launch out into the deep. He say, some of you have been thinking too small. It's bigger than you thought. It's bigger than you thought. Let me close. Last point. Let me close. Last point. God says, the Bible says, when Moses picked it up, here's the last thing. He said, when he picked it up, it returned back to a rod. And God told him, then they will believe that it was me that sent you. I need you to catch this. When he picked it up, it turned it back into a rod. And God said, then they will believe that the Lord God of your fathers, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, had appeared unto thee. They didn't believe when it turned into a snake. They believed when it turned back into a stick. It confused me. I said, wait a minute. That don't make sense. Why would they believe then? Watch this. Because when it turns back into a stick, it's back looking at something that looks insignificant again. It looks like just a normal something. God will always use what doesn't look like much because his glory is revealed in its plainness. Ah. <sighs> You don't want to look anointed. You want to be anointed. <laughs> and, 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 and the less is based on my looks, the more glory God gets. Because, oh, I need you to catch this. I need you to catch this. It turns back into a stick for a few things. It, it, it shows that he can do more with less. Because how did all of that come from from this right here. I just saw it swallow two, two other big snakes. And that's where it come from. So it remind, when it turned back to a rod, it reminded everybody what God was working with. 
See, anybody, any great coach can win with a great team. But you want to show me a great coach? Show me, let me see him win with less talent. <laughs> this is how God works. So his glory is revealed. It turns what? Because when you look at that stick, people think, that's impossible. And the only reason it's impossible is because you spelled it wrong. I am P O S S I B L E. You thought that spelled impossible. That's why things are so impossible for you. You need to look again. You forgot the apostrophe and the space. It's not impossible. It's I'm possible. I'm possible. I'm possible. He, this is I'm possible. Share this morning. I share again. We're going home. Difficult situations are the best situations to see God's glory. The more complicated the situation, the best environment to see miracles. And when you can start seeing impossible situations as possible opportunities, because it reveals what's in your hand. You will never know what's, in, what's really in you until you see what challenges you. Because if God would never let what's outside of you be greater than he that's in you, then you don't know how great your insides are until you look at how big the challenge is on your outside. Ah. One of my old favorite movies <laughs> reveals this. Let's go home. There was this old R&B group in this movie that had an opportunity at the Great Apollo Theater. Oh, it was a great competition. But their biggest rival wanted to stack the deck to ensure their victory because they were afraid of this group. See, when Satan's afraid of you, he will always stack the deck against you. If it looks like you've been put in an unfair situation, that must mean the devil's afraid of you not hearing me. <laughs> He's afraid of you. And this group, the, 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 the group that was afraid of them, he says, hey, my uncle, my uncle is hosting that show. He said, well, yeah, have your uncle to work his magic. He said, yeah, and I'm going to have my girls all on the front row. They going to work for us too. We, go, we got this solidified. And all of a sudden, the host uncle got up and got ready to introduce him. He said, now this next group coming up, they told me to tell you they are better than the Temptations. They better than the Four Tops. They better than Mer Bird and the Midnight Falcons. And all of them put together. He said, but we going to see. So now the crowd is already again. You think you better than the Temptations? You know, they already get you better than four. Ooh, let, let them come out here. Because the, the Apollo Theater is notorious for booing your behind. They waiting to boo. They come there to boo. They, they ain't get dressed to celebrate. They got dressed to hate. <laughs> and they come there. And all of a sudden, then uh, they going to put, tell the man, the P, your piano player, he can't play. The house piano player got to play for every group. He said, man, we ain't practice with nobody else. Duck is our musician. We don't play with nobody else. So, hey, man, get off my back. I don't make the house rules. Just mine. And they put this old unorthodox, old chubby dude on the piano messing up their music. Music is messed up, man. Sound ain't right. Girls on the front row booing, the whole audience booing. 
they throwing oranges and apples and fruit at them. Choir boy take off running because he got hit with a bottle before. It's just all bad. Bad situation. Watch this. Don't miss this. Here's my point. No one's supposed to win under these conditions. God will always allow you to be in a situation where according to societal standards, you're not supposed to win. <laughs> this is how his glory is revealed. And all of a sudden, everything is going bad. Stuff being thrown on the stage. Members of their group running off the stage. The crowd is booing. And it came. Start loosening up his tie. Unbuttoning his top button. And out of nowhere, Duck runs and pushes the man off the piano. And Eddie Kane hits a note that supersedes the booze of the audience. You're not hearing me. When you know what's in your hand, it has the power to supersede everything that's against you. But you keep looking at what's against you. You ain't looking at what's in you. Because what's in you is greater than what's against you. All of a sudden, Eddie Kane grabs the mic. Why are they booing? Oh, oh, oh. All right. Crowd gets silent. He says, takes more than love to build it up, to build it up. And he said, duck, boys, come on back how we used to do it when we didn't have no music. You going to mess up my music? You just made more room for what's in my hand. And with harmonies. Is there a heart? Is there a heart in the house tonight? Stand up, stand up. Let me know, let me know that you understand. For a heart is a house for love. And I've learned that it don't take much to break a heart is a house for love and I've learned that it build it up, build it up, build it up the point is <laughs> that because of the odds against them they made the biggest impression cause ain't no way they were supposed to win in that environment God says I'm gonna make you win with no way your enemies can see it coming I've allowed the deck to be stacked against you to reveal my glory stand up and to face it defeat it have victory it's already yours wrists off. I'm done. God wants you to know. Thank you, Holy Ghost. I hear this. Real soft. I hear this. I hear this. He says, don't let your situation make you think I'm no longer with you. He said, I'm setting you up for the greatest blessing you ever seen. He said, you gotta trust me. You got to trust me. Watch this. Watch this. I'm hearing him talk. He say, and you got to go back to what I told you in the past. Because you've been letting some stuff stay lie dormant for too long. Go, go, Google it. Woo. I don't know who this is for. God said, and I've had to allow the enemy to have his way to some degree to get you back refocused. 
The enemy ain't did nothing but wake you up. Oh, you should have let me sleep because I'm woke now. I'm back, devil, and you don't want to see. I'm back. I'm back. And I'm not leaving without what I come for. Ha! And that's victory. Victory. Now that I'm woke, I ain't through. I got to stop. If you're here and you've never made that wonderful discovery of knowing Jesus Christ in a very personal and intimate way, I want to give you the opportunity to receive Christ today. If you can believe in your heart that Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, died for your sins and you believe God raised him from the dead, why don't you give him your heart today? If you come and just say, Lord, I repent. I believe you died and rose from the dead. You can be saved. If that's you and you want to make that wonderful discovery of knowing Jesus in a personal way, come meet me at this altar. If you're here and God's leading you to join this church, come meet me at this altar. If you're here and he's just leading you because you need a touch. If that's you and you're watching us online right now and you want to make Jesus your Lord, I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Repeat this right now after me. Say, dear Lord, please forgive me for all of my sin I believe your son Jesus died for me and I believe in my heart you raised him from the dead Jesus be my Lord and Savior make the rest of my life the best of my life in Jesus name Amen Amen if you pray that prayer I want you to email us at that email address you're looking at Calvary at gmail.com and let us know when someone will be reaching out to you to help get you started on this Christian journey in Jesus name. I'm hearing this. I'm hearing this. You stay where you are. I'm just hearing this. Let's go. Pass me not oh gentle say yeah, yeah. Oh, Oh, hear, hear my arm bomb, bow, cry. It's offering time in the sanctuary. We're getting ready to go home. If you are giving digitally on every pew at the back of the seats in front of you, there's a QR code. You can scan that QR code with your phone, and it takes you to all of our digital giving platforms. But if you want to give by envelope because you've got cash, money order, or check, raise your hand. Our officers are coming with envelopes. If you need an envelope, just raise your hand, and they'll come serve you right where you are. We believe in giving God what's right, not just what's left. We know God don't need our money, but God does need to know that we give him number one priority. And that's when we put him first. I put him first above my expenses, above my bills, above everything. Because if I do right by God who is the source, he will handle every resource. My job is a resource. Everything's a resource. God is the source. Never neglect the source over a resource. So when we do right by God, 
he will always make a way. And it don't mean I won't ever get challenged financially, but it means I don't have to worry because I know I got seed in the ground. And God will always bring up a heart. To show you God don't care nothing about money, even when we give it to him, he give us back way more than we gave him. To just show you. But it takes our faith and our trust. So we depend on him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father God. So we're going to go before God. Would I get, oh, let me do this too before, before I forget. Anybody with us for the first time? First time visitors. First time visitors, just rave at me. God bless you. We got gift bags for you. I got them on both sides, both sides. Hallelujah. Amen. As they're walking, when they get close to you, just raise your hand so they won't miss you. Amen. I want to say thank you. Thank you for being here with us. God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. All the lovely ladies in the same row, we thank you for joining us. We're so grateful for each and every one. Amen. That have joined us today. Moving forth, remember that we're going to be here next week at 10 o'clock only. So I would say if you ain't used to coming early, you might want to come a little early. Amen. Because <laughs> it won't be at 8 o'clock. It'll be just at 10. So come early. We have our devotionals. Every morning, weekdays, Monday through Friday, I go live at 8 o'clock a.m. On, on Facebook and on YouTube. So join us every morning. If you like, preach, I need to read the Bible more, but I don't know what to read. Just join me every morning on, on Facebook and YouTube. I will carry Facebook and YouTube at CBC Hawthorne. That's on every platform, at CBC Hawthorne. And I also go live on my personal pages. So join us every weekday morning at 8 o'clock a.m. short. And be blessed with us. And we have Bible study, 7 o'clock p.m. Same platforms on Tuesday. Tuesday, 7 o'clock p.m. Amen. At this time, Elder Thomas is going to come. He's going to bless the offering and pray the benediction all in the same prayer. My wife and I are going to be under the canopy. If anyone wants to greet us, we'll be outside. God bless you. God keep you. Elder Thomas.